Okay, Michelle. The um, yeah, we started the webinar and, and it's recording. Thanks, Dave. Hello and welcome to the June 26th meeting of the Amherst Conservation Commission. The time is 7.06. Um, having a bit of technical difficulties with staff Aaron Jock, but I'll just announce that all members are present except Andre, who might be on the phone. Um, in any case, we have staff Dave Zomek and Aaron Jock joining later, hopefully with audio. Uh, first up on the agenda is reports from me, um, Chair. So my, I, I want to comment that we're going to be needing a representative for the Community Preservation Act Committee or a CPAC, um, and that will be coming up in the fall. Um, so for members present, it's uh, about a six week commitment, like once a week from November through early December. Um, and Dave can probably uh, opine more on this, but uh, it's, I've been doing it for two years and I found it a very rewarding and very positive way to engage with the community because you have this money from the Community Preservation Act, which I think is a 3% um, levy on the tax, not a levy, but a percent of taxes, which is matched by the state. And it, the Community Preservation Act Commission meets for, to um, discuss and review and grant uh, money towards community development projects. So it's been a really great way to be involved with um, up and coming capital projects in Amherst. And it's a nice balance to the Conservation Commission, which is very regulatory, to give people money to do great things and see great things happen from it. But please feel free, Dave, to add more to that. No, I mean, I, I think you covered it, Michelle. Are you not able to continue in your role or I will have I mean I would love to so just to you know sell it to the commissioners I would do it again but I have a Thursday commitment coming up for this fall and I will not be able to but again it's a very rewarding and it's a great group it's um like a bunch of people from different commissions and you really get to know a lot of other community leaders and um get to hang out with Dave a little bit more <laughs> um so I'd like to just throw that out there for consideration. It's not it's not a huge time commitment, but it is every week for a, like I don't know a six a six week period. Thursday yes. night. Yes, from like six. I mean, it's a two hour like six to eight kind of thing. Jason, go ahead. What is the role of the representative from the conservation commission on that? So the the role would just be to represent um the commission's interest or basically um you know understanding and uh, of the conservation commission but you're a, a, a sitting board member to the commission so um it'd be like this except everybody comes from all different backgrounds and sort of representing varied interests of the town coming together to make decisions about um you know, up and coming capital and other improvements to the town. Go ahead, Alex. So to be fair, it also involves reading all the proposals and being intimately familiar with those po proposals and then helping to make decisions on which ones get funded. So there, there's work prior to meetings and after That's true. Meetings. Yeah, there's work prior to meetings, but I did it with a you know couple of small children and a full time job and being chair of this committee, so it's possible, <laughs> and um, it's not it, yeah it it's a short sort of sprint, but um, and then there's maybe like a meeting here and there throughout um, in the beginning of the year to tie it to tie it together. I saw another hand up. Anyone else? Yeah, Michelle, I put my hand up and put it down, but uh, you know I'd love to volunteer for that oh awesome jason but on the caveat let me talk to my wife first to see okay yes um it does involve <laughs> support systems yeah. <laughs> um sure yeah so everybody think about that and jason you feel free to get back to us again i would totally do it again and it's been great to spend two consecutive years on it um but i have another obligation this year aaron how are you doing can you do a test test please for us Nope, can't hear you. It Did says you're connecting to audio. Oh. 
my heart goes out to her. Yeah, and also really brings forth the necessity of having Aaron. Okay, you're called in as a participant, except we can see you. Okay, I'm going to let you talk. Are you, are you 5242? Can't really add you. Dave, um, if you go to the attendees and you see a 5242, is that you, Aaron? Can you just raise your hand to confirm that's you? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yay. All right. Through various methods, here we are. <laughs> okay. Yeah. If your sharing's all queued up. <laughs> all right. Um, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Okay. Well, we'll... Luckily, it's not a heavy load tonight, so we'll do what we can. Um, all right, so that from me on to Dave for the director's report. Sure, and I'll be fairly brief. And Jason, if you have any questions about the, the CPAC, just give me a call or shoot me an email. We can connect. You know, the projects are in the four categories, open space, recreation, affordable housing, and uh, historic preservation. So um, you do get, as Michelle said, you get to see a an interesting mix of projects from the town and and also from uh, other nonprofits and organizations that might be seeking CPA funds. So uh, all good stuff. I don't have a lot of updates tonight. Um, let's see. You know, field season is kind of in full swing right now. We were able to fund uh, two part time uh, seasonal uh, folks to help out Brad and Anthony on the trails at Puffer's Pond. Uh, we're a little behind right now on on upkeep um, because there's been some early vacations and um, other staff out. So we'll try to get caught up at the various locations. Puffer's Pond, um, with all the, the warm weather, has been uh, busier than normal. We've been very lucky and, and fortunate in, uh, that early Early uh, water quality testing has come in uh, acceptable at acceptable levels. And uh, we just, we try to test on Mondays of every week. Uh, this week is a little bit odd. So um, those test results should come in tomorrow. Again, we have some, we had some pretty big rain over the weekend and that is never a good omen for us. So uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed that Puffer Spond uh, again, um, test positive as, or excuse me, tests, uh, the levels of, of E. coli and bacteria are low enough to be acceptable. And uh, as we approach the 4th of July weekend uh, next week. Um, let's see. Um, again, trail work, um, uh, moderate bri uh, uh, bridge repair uh, will be going on, things like that. Um, the Hickory, the trails at Hickory are coming on uh, along very nicely. Uh, recall these were funded by two sources, a park grant from the state and community development block grant funds. And so we are racing the clock to get those trails at least done to a level that we can get the reimbursement from the state. I don't anticipate fully opening those trails until the fall uh, once we get up signage and benches and things of that sort. But um, they're coming, al coming along really nicely at Hickory. Um, speaking of Hickory, um, congratulations to Erin. She uh, wrote a successful, another successful grant uh, application to the state for more funding for trails at Hickory, which we desperately will need because um, the money doesn't go as far as it used to. So Erin uh, was successful in pulling together a grant for about $100,000, $110,000 um, that we will use to kind of connect the so-called loop trail at Hickory with the North-South Trail that uh, goes all the way up to uh, in the neighborhood of uh, East Hadley Road. So um, again, that work won't start on that trail probably until late August, but um, kudos to uh, Aaron for, for bringing in that uh, funding, which will pay for uh, repairing, significantly repairing one of the, the pedestrian bridges over the Fort River and then extending our trail system. So um, that's kind of the update, uh, the updates I have. I'll be brief. Thanks, Dave. Um, so next up is the open space and recreation plan update. I'm looking at it. 
Oops, sorry. Thank you. Um, I'm always looking at the outdated agenda. Okay, so we have two minutes to approve. Um, and then I'm looking for a motion to approve such minutes. Yeah, I have a question first. Go ahead, Alex. Um, maybe I've missed it in the past, but I'm having a problem approving a 2020 minute. And yeah, so just to give some background, in 2020, there was a drop off in staff support. And so there's been more recent um, influx of staff support to get some minutes done. And if you can't, you know, I, I understand that's, you know, you weren't there. <laughs> um, but that's sort of the background is that there are some challenges in 2020, as we all know, and we're catching up with things based on new staff support for getting some minutes backlogs done. So I'm happy to approve the minutes where I was a member, but I'm probably going to abstain just because I didn't go back and check the 2020 stuff. Okay. Is it possible to split it that way? Sure. Do you want to make a motion to do such thing? Yes, I make a motion to, I don't have the date in front of me, but it was the 16th, I think. Um, yeah. Let's see, I printed out, I printed out the meeting. The 12th. It was. For the 12th. Uh, I printed out the meetings for, uh, hold on. So it's 92320 and 61224. So 61224 is probably the one you'd like to move yeah. on. Um, um, I move to abstain from approving September 22, 23, excuse me, 2020, 20. Can I start over? Yeah. <laughs> Get my words straight. Uh, I move to abstain from approving September 23, 2020 minutes and approve minutes from June 16th, 2024. Alex, can you make a motion to approve them separately so that not everybody has to move on abstaining? I think that's sort of a personal vote. Okay. So if you, yeah. Can I make a motion to approve the 2020 stuff and then abstain from it? Sure. Uh, I see Aaron's hand up. So Aaron, you want to enlighten us? Yeah. So yeah. can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, nobody on this board except for Laura was present um, and accounted for when the 2020 minutes were were took place. So if if the entire commission decides to abstain from voting on them since they weren't on the board at the time, we won't be able to pass them, um, which is fine. And if you if you choose not to do that, that's your choice. Um, but it's really just an administrative sort of courtesy to the public so that we have a written record of that meeting. If commissioners would prefer to um, wait and watch the proceeding on YouTube before um, proceeding with, you know, making any judgments relative to approving them, that's completely fine. Erin, can we publish the minutes without approving them as a commission? So in order that for them to be public record, we have to approve it here tonight. Okay, Bruce, go ahead. I, I propose that Laura, uh, ask Laura to do the, the basic motion. If she does that, I'll second it for the 2020 minutes. Then we can vote on it and then, then we can do the 24 one separately. Thanks, Bruce. Laura, did All you right. yep. feel comfortable? I okay. will make a motion to vote on, to approve the 2020, what month are we talking about? What date? 9-23-2020. 9-23-2020. Minutes. My second. All right. Motion from Laura. Bruce on the second. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Rachel? Abstain. Alex? Abstain. Laura? Aye. Uh, and I'm an I, so I think we have enough to pass that. Okay, Alex, do you want to go for the next motion for 6-12-24? 6-12-24. Yeah, yes. I move that we approve the minutes for 6-12-24. 20, 
24. I second. Okay. Yeah. Alex in the motion, Rachel in the second. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Rachel? Aye. Alex? Aye. Laura? Aye. And I'm an aye. Is okay. This, is this gonna is, is this gonna come up again? Uh Aaron? Yes. Yeah. Gonna... Yes, it okay. will. It's gonna come up again on several sets. Yep. Okay, just as long as I know. Okay. Sorry for about that. Nope. Reasonable. Okay. Um land management updates. Okay, this is urban space and recreation plan update and public information session. So are we, Aaron, are you good with presenting? And then we're going to open it for public comment. Um, so this yeah. is in regard to the Amherst Open Space and Recreation Plan update. We're going to be focusing on the open space component of this tonight. And Aaron is going to be briefing us on um, some survey results and the staff updates on the plan. So go ahead, Aaron. All right, I'm gonna. <clears throat> oh boy. Um, yeah, are you able to access? I, um, I don't think that because I'm logged in through my browser and not through um, the Zoom app, I can't, I don't think I'm gonna be able to share my screen. Michelle, is there any way you could open the um in the OneDrive and share your screen. I can try. Why don't you give us some verbal introduction while I yeah. do that? Sure. So um town staff, several town staff, members of the planning department, members of the conservation department, sustainability, the recreation department, um uh Diversity, equity, and inclusion has also been involved, um, has took on um, development of the open space and recreation plan update. Um, as part of that, a survey was developed in early 2024. The survey was out for the public, um, I want to say between February and May for data collection. We got the survey results back. Um, after this, the survey results came back, we did some um, initial assessment of some of the results of the survey um, and sort of devised the top most important things to um, residents for recreation and conservation. Um, uh, so um, we Aaron, also scheduled I'm sorry, four... can I just interject for a second? Dave, do you mind or yes. can you give me um, the ability to share my screen? You should be able to, Michelle. Um, I can't okay, make you I got post, it. unfortunately. I got it. Okay. Sorry. Um, so as a follow-up to the, and we're probably going to have to do this all night, unfortunately, until I get this issue addressed on the computer, but um, as a follow-up to the, the survey, um, we uh, conducted four public information sessions. Two of them took place, well, one, two of them took place at recreation areas, two of them took place at conservation areas. Um, one was at Puffer's Pond, one was at Groff Park, one was at Mill River Recreation Area, and one was held at Amethyst Brook. Um, and there's also been many sort of um, brainstorming sessions with staff reviewing the survey and incorporating public input. So based on all those pieces of information, um, we are putting together draft goals, um, draft objectives, and draft action items as part of the open space and recreation plan. And so that's the document that I shared with you. Um, Michelle, you had it up a second ago and it clicked off. I don't know if there's any way to get it back. The memo, not the document. It? There we go. And then if you, if you could zoom in um, a little bit. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the purpose of the, the session tonight is to share with the commission um, the goals, objectives, and action items that are currently drafted. These are, these are rough and um, 
to get input from the Conservation Commission and also input from members of the public on what their um, wishes and desires are relative to conservation lands. So that's, that's the purpose of the meeting tonight, is to kind of collect additional information. Um, with that said, um, I, I did upload this kind of late today because this is like hot off the press. Um, I'm happy to sort of run through it with everyone, um, if that makes sense, whatever format you want me to, to follow. Um, I am feeling challenged in following along with this <laughs> um, without you having controls on the screen um, and having not looked at it. But if, you know, if you want to direct me to scroll, I can do that so we can have a brief overview to maybe prep us for like looking at this on our more personal time and getting back to you, Bruce, go mm -hmm. ahead. Uh, are there time constraints that, re that essentially require us to do this tonight, given that it got uploaded quite late and we're having logistics problems? Can we have another couple of weeks to really dig into it and, and then discuss it next time? Michelle, if I could jump in maybe. Yeah, I think Bruce's idea is, is a very good idea, given um, originally we were quite constrained and we, we needed to get this plan, at least the draft plan, done by the first or second week of July. Um, recent decisions we've made have given us more time to, uh, to develop the plan. So I think given the technology challenges tonight and, and the fact that it was uploaded a little later than, than had hoped for, I, I think it's fine to just do kind of a cursory overview tonight if Aaron agrees and then bring this back at the next meeting. Do you think that would work, Aaron? Sure. And um, anybody who has anybody from the public, we can take public comment, you know, tonight if folks have comments or, you know, we could also take public comment at the next meeting as well. Thanks, Aaron. And just to orient ourselves, are the goals in any specific order? Just is there like some nexus between the survey results and then how this is presented on this memo? It's not presented in any sort of priority um, okay. list, if that makes sense. It's it's um, it's a combination. So, and some of the goals are a combination of multiple results. So, for example, um, we got feedback. I'll just give you one example that folks wanted greater walking access to schools, um, the safe school routes. Um, and then we also got comments that people wanted um, safe walking routes to recreation areas. So, like the first um, goal. Uh, um, is relative to, um, you know, strategic connections between open space, recreation areas, and village centers. Um, but, you know, that also that also is going to include safe walking routes to school as well. Um, and and so the the purpose is like there's a there's an overall overarching goal that the town which it wishes to achieve, and then there's objectives that we wish to achieve, and then there's action items associated with that which are sort of the, the action items that staff will will work towards achieving um, as we go to implement the plan over the next seven years, um, if that makes sense. And some of the goals are similar to that. Um, so for example, like under conservation, the top three responses we got for um, uh, what was most important to people was preservation of watershed lands, um, preservation of land around private wells and um, preservation of our uh, um, protection of drinking water. So those three were sort of merged into um, protection of diversity, which was the fourth um, highest response. So we, we sort of tried to group some of the responses to tackle these goals um, because a lot of them are very interconnected and a lot, a lot of the activities that go into protecting lands also contribute to protecting biodiversity. So what you just mentioned is is couched into goal to protect biodiversity, watershed, and natural resource. Um, off the bat, I don't see a lot about water protection, but I can do that offline. I don't, I mean, I don't see any 
Interesting. Okay. I don't know who had their hand up first, Bruce or Alex. I'll just go from the top. Bruce. No, Alex was first. Alex. I'm just curious if we have members of the public online interested in this. And if not, then the briefing is for the commission only. I'm just curious. I will take public comment. So let's just get through some commissioner comments and then we'll we'll get to that. Go ahead, okay. Bruce. Pretty quickly, and Dave can correct me or augment. Um, reminding that the purpose, a purpose of this document is it's in, extremely important in and of itself in that it guides what the town does, but it's also necessary in order to apply for a fair number of different state programs. You got to have an updated OSRP. That's yep. correct. Yeah, that's correct. Mm -hmm. And we do an update. The state has been typically on five year cycles, sometimes extending that to seven year, um, you know, updates. So, and I just wanted to add, you, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to blend as Aaron suggested, these are not all conservation specific. You know, we are, you know, under, under strategic connections, it could be sidewalks, you know, we need to extend sidewalks uh, and improve sidewalks to get people between recreation areas and village centers and schools. So there's a blending of, of recreation and conservation, but also just community development um, because we won't achieve all of those connections via trails. Yeah, and just to sort of um, piggyback on what Dave said, I think it's really important to read the document as a whole because a lot of the goals, there's a, a significant amount of redundancy. Um, so, for example, further down in the goals, there's a, a goal related to climate change, sustainability, um, and uh, I think uh, I, I don't have the have the language in front of me, unfortunately. Um, let me see. Sorry, it's really hard to switch between screens when I can't see um, what's going on, but um, it is related to um, climate resiliency, sustainability, public awareness, uh, equity and inclusion in all recreation and open space programs. And so that's a very, very broad goal. Um, and, and a lot of the um, objectives and action items on that are also related to the other goals. So what we're trying to do is, you know, have all these sort of all of our action items listed, but also not have so much redundancy under each um, under each goal and objective that it's it's duplicated multiple times. So I do think it's really important to look at the whole document. Um, and so, yeah, I think it does make sense to give everybody an opportunity to review it. Um, and I, um, again, these are these are very r rough. They're a conglomeration of some goals um, or some action items from last last round that um, were sort of carried over. There's um, a lot of contributions from the survey, from the public information sessions, and also from from staff knowing what projects and needs are um, uh, sort of coming down the line in the next seven years that we're hoping to to tackle. So, okay, thanks, Erin. And the previous open space plan is available online if anybody wants to see the predecessor. Um, I think you could just sort of Google those keywords. So if there's any public comment on this, please raise your hand now and I'll keep an eye on it. Is there is there any document in this folder that I should bring up on my screen, Erin, or is this the one? Is yeah, that's the I... document to bring up. And I okay. I think it's I think that really what's critical here is what's important to people. We we just want to hear what's important to people so that um we can incorporate public comment as much as possible into the document. And how have the listening sessions gone so far? How many have you had? How many more are there? Um, there has been four public information sessions that have been held. Um, I would say they've been they've been really successful. Um, we've engaged with a lot of people. Um, there's been 
really, really positive success. The events, we had posters where we sort of listed the top, um, the, some of the sur top survey results, and we also provided a list of sort of our recommended action items. Um, and these were very general, um, but just to have people, we, we gave people stickers and let them pick their top three. Um, and then if they participated, we gave them um, some wildflower native pollinator seeds for participating. Um, and people were really excited about it. A lot of kids participated. Um, and, uh, you know, it was really interesting. Uh, we, we didn't really plan it out this way, but I did um, sort of go through and um, review some of the survey results. Um, and as it turns out, Amethyst Brook was our, our highest most popular conservation area in the town of Amherst. Um, and then it was closely followed by Puffer's Pond. So it was really funny that we picked those two to do our information sessions. And uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was great. Um, it was really nice to engage with people and get positive feedback. People were really happy that we were out there doing it. And we got posters. Uh, we got we have the posters that people actually contributed their ideas to. We wrote notes on them. Um, so that information is also being um, uh, sort of tallied up so that we can incorporate that as well into the. And this is by no means a final draft. This is this is a working draft that we're sharing with you. So we want to hear feedback from folks. Um, we want to to hear. There's something's missing. We need to add this in. Um, so by all means, and written comments are welcome. If people want to, you know, email me comments or, um, you know, we can do some more public input at the next session. Could you just tell us when the next session is and or where to find information for that, like upcoming ones? Well, we've we've. We've done four already. There's no additional ones planned um, as of right now. Um, I'm not sure with the timeline of wrapping it up, how many more sessions, if we're going to have any more. I think the plan was for us to have public information sessions at the Conservation Commission meeting, the Planning Board meeting, <laughs> and the Rec Committee meeting. OK. Um, all right, so given that we'll be revisiting this at our next meeting, I assume that we'll have another um, opportunity for public comment on the open space and rec plan. Okay, I see one public. Um, I'm just going to go to Alex first. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, if you're looking for comments, I, I'll provide some, but it has to do primarily with just organizing the thing. The goals are complex and multidimensional and which makes stepping them down difficult. So I maybe I'll provide some comments that might help you in that in that regard. Okay, thanks Alex. Yeah, and we know that each each objective is going to have a list of goals under it, so there is some organization that's going to happen between now and the final document, but more than welcome to submit your suggestions. We're happy to incorporate those. Okay, um Jenny <laughs> I don't seem to have the ability to let people in. So perhaps Dave or Aaron could do that. I can I can do that, Michelle. Thanks. Hi, Jenny. Name and address, please. She's we're already... not, yeah, we're not hearing you. Do you want to? You're on. It's you seem to be muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Just a very brief comment to say thank you. This kind of listening to the community as an example, uh, the tremendous work that goes into it, what must have been involved with uh, Aaron and the whole committee, but also the gesture towards the community of hearing what's important to people. Unfortunately, this doesn't happen terribly often around town. Uh, 
clearly it's a huge undertaking. So I just wanted to thank everybody for the effort that you're making. I look forward to uh, looking at the document. It's a terrific example, leadership example for the whole town. I very much hope that the town sees you doing this and thinks about listening on many subjects as well as this one. So thanks to everyone for all this hard work. Very much appreciated. Thanks, Jenny. Do you mind giving your name and address for the minute? Ticker? Okay. And it's Jenny Kalick, and I'm 147 Shootsbury Road in Amherst. Thanks, Jenny. You. Okay. Um, and I'll need you also to dismiss people, Aaron, unless you can make me a co-host and then I can handle these things. All right, um, I'm seeing no more comments from the public. So um, to wrap this up, commissioners, please review the information in your packets and yeah. next meeting, we will have a more in-depth discussion about this. But in the meantime, I think that providing any comments to Aaron is reasonable. And hopefully I haven't checked, but we have some public um, response data in our packets as well which is something that I'm interested in seeing. Okay, segueing to our hearing, I think. Sorry, I've just got to navigate now. Okay, hearings. Each hearing has 20 dedicated minutes on the agenda. Um, hearing structure is five minutes from staff, five minutes from the applicant, five minutes for public comment, five minutes from commissioners. The commissioners require that all submitted and revised materials be submitted between when, by Wednesday, the week prior to the meeting at close of business. And for all presenters, clearly stating your name, the address of the project, and who you are representing, as well as public comment. So hearing one, this is a new one. Um, this public hearing is called to order. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth and Act relative to the protection of the wetlands as most recently amended in Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. And this is a notice of intent for SWCA on behalf of the University of Massachusetts for an after the fact notice of an intent application for the construction of a pavilion and associated site work in the Orchard Hill residential area at 152 Orchard Hill Drive. The project includes work within the 100 foot buffer to bordering vegetated wetlands, WPA, and within the Amherst bylaw jurisdictional waterway. Um, we have a site visit, site visit scheduled for this, um, and we are looking to continue this one. I don't think that the butter notification has happened as with other required acts to um, proceed with the meeting. So I am looking for a motion to continue the public hearing for the UMass 152 Orchard Hill Drive 710-24 at 730. I move to continue the public hearing for the UMass 152 Orchard Hill Drive to 7, 10, 24 at 7.30 p.m. Second that. I have Alex on the motion, Jason on the second. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Rachel? Aye. Alex? Aye. Laura? Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay, um, next up, 35, good. Um, so this is the NOI for Karen Environmental Consulting LLC on behalf of LLS E Fornax LLC and WD Coles Inc. for the construction of a battery storage system associated to access road improvements and stormwater management within the buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetlands on Montague Road Route 63, map 2A, lot 18. Again, we um, are looking to continue this hearing. Um, well, Michelle? Yep. Michelle, um, I mean, the applicants here tonight, they've submitted revisions. Um, I, 
I was thinking it might be a good idea to let them present their um, revisions to us. I I did have some comments, which I shared with the commission um, again late this afternoon. Uh, so I think there might be some additional things that we're going to need to deal with relative to the plan set. But I think getting a general update, I believe their um, uh, consultant who prepared the um, invasive species plan is in attendance. So they might be able to answer questions and provide additional detail to the commission on some of the mitigation. Okay, thanks. And before we do that, when was the um, land submitted to us? Late this afternoon for okay. the comments. All right, I did not have a chance to look what, at it, so what? I'm... What? What's that, Aaron? Go ahead. Aaron. I'm sorry, my comments, my, my comments were provided to you this afternoon. The updated plans from the applicant were provided last Wednesday. So they, okay. they've been in our board packet from the time the notice was sent out. Okay, yeah, let yeah. us bring in, hold on, Alex, let's just bring in the applicant, let them present, and then we can ask questions. We're still going to be continuing this, but um, just because staff hasn't had time to provide comments that we've had a chance to review. Okay, I see a Jeff and a Scott. Can you uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you have some feedback. I don't know if it's just me, but um, perhaps everyone can mute themselves. Not you, Scott, but we will. Well, Is that I'd like to like let Jeff, Jeff speak first. first. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you. You've got um, you've got Scott Smyers from Oxbow on. We also have um, we submitted in our packet an updated site plan um, and stormwater reports, a secondary containment uh, structural design, and an invasive species uh, invasive plant control plan, um, which Scott is on to speak to. Um, we have all of our consultants on the call, but. Uh, understand that there was some question um, about the stormwater. It doesn't sound like that was able to be reviewed. So with respect to the site plan and stormwater report, um, and maybe even some of the containment structure questions, we're happy to talk about continuing those. Um, if you want to hear um, a presentation from Scott with respect to the invasive um, plant control plan. So you're proposing that we hear from Scott tonight and uh, the rest of the items next time. Is that right? We're prepared to present on them, but if you have not had a chance to review them, we want to be respectful of, of the commission's time. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, Scott, why don't you go ahead and let's check your audio again. Hello. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, that's better. Thank you. All right. And should I share my screen to show the report and talk about that a little bit? Please do. Bruce, I see your hand up. Is there a logistical question? You're muted. It's um, note taking. I don't know who telephone 516 6, et cetera, is. <laughs> um. As far as attendees, Bruce, that's what you're worried about. I believe that it might be Andre. Um, I'm not sure, but he uh, was he is he is out of town right now and just listening in, but not able to participate. So that okay. could be Thank you. what the number you're seeing is. Okay. Okay. Well, if if I may, then I'll just proceed with my brief discussion about invasive plant control. Uh, I submitted a report you see here dated June 12th about invasive plant control at the site. And the idea is to do a selective herbicide application, uh, a lot of cut stem. So cut the stem and apply 
herbicide directly to the cut stem at the base. You don't uh, have a chance to uh, spread it around that way. However, if it is, uh, if the leaves are dense enough, I'd prefer to use a, a, a backpack sprayer in some of those cases. So I like to use both of those methods. And then we submit a report explaining uh, the uh, results with the GPS plan, showing the locations of most of the invasive plants. And then after that's been completed, we'll have some recommendations about replanting, but we like to keep that as flexible as possible until we see what we have to work with. If there are good native species that are recruiting in and coming back, uh, we don't need to plant extra shrubs from a nursery in those areas. We can just uh, provide, uh, encourage the native growth to come in on its own and keep working on uh, removing the others. But, you know, we could plant uh, viburnums and other shrubs that we have seen on the site. Uh, but the species that we have seen, you know, is, is a lot of uh, uh, glossy buckthorn, black locust, and bittersweet. Uh, and then we would follow up with selective herbicide applications and documentation for what I understand is the length of the lease period, which is for 20 years or so. Um, the idea would be to maintain 10% or less of invasive plants within the area. If I just scroll down to this plan at the bottom. So this is what we had proposed as our work area. So here, here's where the, the actual project is happening. If you can see my cursor, um, you know, that's where the work is proposed. But this whole area is where we would do the invasive plant control. Um, standard methods with that is to stay away from any open water if you're spraying anything, right? If you, we, we, we're just going to avoid that altogether. Um, although we could use a different product, but I don't think that's going to be necessary here because you do have wetlands, but they're not necessarily a, a wetland with a pond or surface water throughout the whole area. It's a stream that goes through um, fairly narrow. Uh, and so, but there's a lot of invasive species in that whole area, but it's not 100% invasive species. So I'm optimistic we'll have some good recruitment from the uh, nat native plants that are already there once we uh, release some of the competition associated with the dense buckthorn and 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 locust and 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 uh, bittersweet. So I think that sums it up, and I'm here to answer any questions for you and uh, anything I can do to explain it further. Thanks, Scott. Um, I have a question off the bat. Um, so I did visit the site at the point where I visited there. It wasn't clear or marked where this area, this mitigation area was. And I do appreciate how big it is. Um, and I did look around for invasives. And one of the requests that we had made the last time we talked to the um, applicants was for a preliminary map of where the invasives were. And the reason for that is because our preliminary site visit walk didn't really find much invasives at all. And what we did find was a lot of alder. And from uh, my, the pictures, I initially thought that was buckthorn, but it, it actually is alder along a very sandy bank along that stream. Um, yeah. And I was just wondering if you had done any preliminary mapping or if you could show us specifically where the invasives that you've mentioned are. Well, yeah, I know uh, alder can be confused with buckthorn, but I saw a lot of buckthorn throughout this area. And I saw a lot of locust over here and then some bittersweet here and then more over here. So I just... I mean, I don't have a detailed map, but we can do that as we go. But when I first went out there, you know, we weren't even sure if we were going to be working on this project at that time. So I did a preliminary evaluation, took a bunch of pictures, looked at it from there and said, oh, well, it looks like there's quite a few invasives, you know, in this whole area. So if we could just selectively treat in this area, I think that'd be the best thing uh, for for us to do. But maybe you know whatever you whatever you ask for we can provide but um it, it, okay. you know I, we might we 
I might recommend that we do that after you know our first round of treatment, and then we'll really have a good understanding of it, uh, and we can GPS it at, as we're there. But we can do it ahead of time if if that's what you require. Okay. Um. Well, your date, your site visit date was in April, right? Or have yeah. you, you did it? You didn't do one after that. Okay. So no. I think commissioners uh, followed your site visit, and I know Alex was there, and I think. Bruce and Rachel were also there. Um, so we did probably a more um, leafed out version of a survey while we were there. Yeah, um, and this is important because we're relying a lot about the this project and this mitigation being how much is being mitigated for. So if this is a highly invaded site, that's different than this is a low invaded site and what is the ecological lift that you're proposing here. So if um, it is primarily alder and maybe small sections of buckthorn and locust, that's different from a heavily invaded site that won't really benefit from a lot of herbicide treatment. So that's why I was really advocating for some mapping okay. to show us what is on the ground now and what could be offered as mitigation for this project. Go ahead, Bruce. Well, at the risk of taking more of, it, of people's times, would given that difference, would it be good to have an additional site visit with the person who's here tonight so people are in agreement about what's on there? Yeah, I think that this preliminary site visits were done before leaf out and like bittersweet and um, some of those are much obviously easier to identify now than they were in April. So I I am in support of a second site visit. Um, any other commissioner comments, questions? Alex, go ahead. Alex, you're muted. No. Alex. All right, Aaron, do you want to talk, Willux? Oh, here I am. Okay. Uh, thanks, Michelle. I am a little disappointed in what we're getting here um, because the question was, how bad is it? And this doesn't, to just say there's a lot of it doesn't tell us much. So I, I would propose that we look for a third party person to get involved uh, rather than site visits. We've already done that a couple of times. Uh, we provided the applicant with pretty detailed requests and uh, it's not coming forward. So uh, that's my suggestion is go to a third party to give us a read here. Thanks, Alex. Erin? I have a question and I'm not sure if it's for Scott or if it's for um, one of the uh, other folks on the call. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry, I'm recovering from a cold. Um, I noticed on the plan, uh, looking at an older um, iteration of the revisions and a newer iteration of the revisions, that there was a wetland H, which was an isolated wetland, which showed up or, on the original plan set and somehow in the course of the revisions sort of dropped off. Um, so buffer zones changed over time um, from including that sort of what appeared to be isolated wetland to all of a sudden that wetland not being present on the site or not being shown on the site. And I'm just curious um, because I know Rachel brought brought the um, flags, flag numbers H, um, the southernmost ones, there was two of them which cast buffers close to the site. Um, and I think she observed that in her comments that they were missing, but when one of the sets of revisions came in, that wetland was no longer present on the site and it wasn't until this latest draft came in that I noticed it. And I was just curious if anybody on the applicant's team could address why that wetland disappeared from the plan set. Yeah, that's a great question, Aaron. So um, we actually reached out um, today. The flags you're referring to were delineated in our 20, 18 site plans that we submitted for the solar originally. Um, so that was identified some six or it might even have been a 2017 plan. We spoke with Chuck Karen, who um, 
we submitted that wetland set to Conservation Commission in our original application, and it was requested by Conservation Commission that we re-delineate the site. So we updated the delineation with Karen Environmental, and there is no wetland in that area. We don't know if that's a result of Eversource's significant work in this area over the last six or seven years, but if you uh, if you perform your field visit, we walked through that area multiple times, and <clears throat> there just is no wetland there. So um, it's not an area that's been in our site control for seven years, and don't know why it was delineated seven years ago. And um, when Chuck delineated this a couple of years ago, it, it's not there as of 2022. Okay. Um, so I feel like that's something that I would also want to field verify um, as well. Just, uh, I, I'm i not um, disputing the findings that you're presenting. I just would like to visually verify it because when we were out there, that was not clear. And I just want to make sure that we're checking it to verify that it's no longer um, there on the site. Sure. We're happy to do a data plot and soil probe. And I think that makes sense. Okay. I mean, just by way of like um, additional field work, I was thinking that it might be a good idea if we're discussing another site visit that we sort of handle all things that might require field verification in one shot, because I know we've already had two site visits. Agreed. Um, does it make sense to, um, yeah, I mean, we have some materials that it doesn't sound like we're gonna get to tonight. Does it make sense to review those in a subsequent meeting before we plan the site visit? I um, go yeah. there. So I, I was going to defer to you. Um, I guess the only benefit I see to us reviewing the um, additional plan revisions would be if any other questions came up, which would require some sort of field verification because um, the plan design has changed um, you know, boundaries of print of the project has changed um, and, and also some additional elements have changed relative to soil movement. So, I mean, by way of like some soils might need to be taken off site, new soils brought on site, um, additional stormwater structures being installed. So I guess I would defer to the commission as to whether you guys would want a full presentation on the stormwater um, management plan and full review by staff before we schedule an additional site visit, or if you'd prefer to get the site visit before we move forward with additional um, presentation. Um, I have a question that you just sort of touched on, which was the footprint. And I recall from our last meeting that the footprint could have expanded or contracted based on soils and design of the project. So has anything significant happened in that respect that would change what we were seeing on the ground if we did a site visit? Yeah, I mean, it might be helpful um, uh, Jeff, for one of your team members to pull up the new plan, but but my review of the plan, um, it appears that uh, the footprint of the pad is shrunk, um, so they reduced the footprint and pulled the pad out of the 50 foot um, and reduced mm -hmm. it significantly, so um, it might be nice to just show them that that changed. Sure. No, that'd be great. I will, um, I will, Pass things over to uh, on the call. We've got uh, Tim Kuhn from J.R. Russo and Associates um, who can talk about the updated site plan. Um, and we he he could speak to this stormwater report. It doesn't sound like we'll get to that tonight. Um, but I think your point is well taken. It, we've certainly moved all of our equipment, fencing, et cetera, out of the 50 foot um, setback and he's added some other features that he can speak specifically to. So let me pull up the site plan and hand it over to Tim Kuhn. I'm not seeing Tim in the attendees. Is it possible there's a, a phone number or a- Yes, oh, he, he is, he told okay. me he is Dana Steele. So uh, I, I did not oh, okay. know this is okay. alias tonight, but tonight Tim will be Dana Steele. Okay, <laughs> okay. got it.
Good evening. Can you hear me? Yep. Welcome, Dana. Yep. Or sorry, Tim. Tim. Yes. <laughs> Forgive me. I'm on. It's Dana's account. So if there's any issues, it's all Dana's fault. So, all right. So if you'd like, I can share my screen to show you the updated uh, site plan area, if that would be best. We'll go with that. So can everybody see that? This this is a uh, the site plan of the proposed equipment pad and the and the access road that is being proposed to come down off of the existing utility access road to it. And it uh, says I blow in here. You can see we we have changed the configuration of the pad. Um, by doing some modifications with the equipment and the setbacks. And now we have pulled the entire pad itself and all the equipment outside of the 50 foot buffer, which is designated by this gold line, if you will. Okay. Uh, with regard to stormwater management, we have added a, a sediment four bay to collect the runoff from our access drive, our gravel access ride. And then we will be, uh, that will provide the pretreatment, and then we pipe it down to an infiltration trench uh, located down at the uh, the other end of the equipment pad, which will uh, infiltrate what it can and then overflow um, kind of as a level spreader down in that location so that uh, any larger storm events would continue to just sheet flow and continue on down to the wetlands. So this has uh, reduced the amount of activity that's actually in the uh, the 50 foot area. Um, and I believe that was one of the requests of the commission at the prior meetings. Thanks, Sam. Are you, are you going still? <laughs> or is that the conclusion? Okay. It sounds like Tim's done. Um, Alex, do you have a question? Yeah, has the new design been staked? Uh, no, it has not. I think the one that was staked was the old design. We have not made a modification to the new corners of the pad. So I would recommend that we not have a site visit until the new design is staked and the old stakes are removed or I don't think we need the old stakes, but it was very handy to um, be able to visualize everything using the stakes, and that that it's, that just made it crystal clear. Indeed, it was handy, and if we do do a site visit, having some kind of uh, delineation of the mitigation area would be helpful, um, even if it's you know corners and center points, but. It was kind of hard to get a lay of the land uh, based on a map when you're just out there and it's a large acreage. Any other commissioner comments? Rachel. Yeah, I'm just curious um, if I could, um, mm -hmm. um, what kind of batteries are you installing? The current batteries that are proposed here are a Sokamec, which is a lithium uh, ion battery manufactured in Toronto. Thanks, Jeff. Rachel? I um, had a question about uh, if you are going out on site and doing field work, um, if you have anybody with a sur survey equipment out there, there's substantial differences between the LIDAR you're using in the plans and what's out there. And I think that's because of the Eversource work that happened um, after your survey. Uh, so they're, they're large earth berms. Um, it's very different drainage wise upslope of the area. Um, the area that's in the easement or the for ever source, you know, when they built their road and stuff. So I think it would be helpful to see that, um, or at least know that you're acknowledging those changes and considering those stormwater impacts coming into the project area, um, especially if you're looking at modeling what's happening on site. Okay, so Rachel, you're saying that the LIDAR used to 
do the current stormwater modeling is not necessarily consistent with currently what's on the ground. Correct. And like okay. some of the areas upslope, um, the pad upslope where the like where the concrete washing area and that area is is different in the field than what's on the plans. Yeah, it's an existing condition, topography wise. Thanks, Rachel. Um, any other commissioner comments? I, I it would be helpful also. Um, I don't know if, if the applicant can talk about it tonight. I'm not familiar with the containment system um, at all. I'm just curious how that works and what that interaction is with both um, with rainwater and then contaminated water, how, how that system operates. Um, I, I mean, I welcome if someone wants to address that question right now. Yep, thanks. Um, thanks, Rachel and Michelle. Um, we've got uh, Colin Cannon on from our team. Uh, who can speak to that uh, speak to that element? Um, and so, Colin Cannon, <clears throat> are you in by are you dialed in by phone, Colin? I don't know if his name shows up or um, how. Yeah, you can... I can pull him in. Yeah, I see him in the um, attendees. Great, thank you. Hi, can you all hear me? We can, welcome Colin. Yeah, thank you. So we do uh, have secondary containment design into our uh, current equipment pads, which are going to be slabs on grade. <clears throat> and if you'd like, I can pull up a design uh, that we've done on that. So yep, please do. Let's uh, share my screen. Two. All right, and so uh, I think if I make this a little larger, this is one of the best equipment slabs and you can see that uh, the extents of the equipment are right here. And then this is uh, a, a foundation design that's very similar to a standard um, maybe substation transformer where there's a, a bathtub of sorts designed into the side with a metal grating on top and that's sized to uh, hold all of the liquid coolant uh, that's inside of those batteries. And then there are pre-filters and filters uh, designed to let out uh, clean water, but uh, trap any anything that's not water uh, from leaving. And um, there's a, a profile view of that foundation. Thanks, Colin. Mm -hmm. So it traps solids and lets through water. That's right. It would it would trap the uh, the coolant that's in the batteries, which is uh, very similar to an automotive coolant uh, that you would find in a vehicle, and so that's a propylene glycol or or similar uh, type coolant. And it's a selective filter that does pass water, but not that coolant. And that's, you're, sorry, no, you're talking in the event of a coolant spill? Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah, in the just, event of a catastrophic event. Yeah, yes, but just in general, that filter just allows water to pass through? Yes. So storm water will be passing through that? Correct. Is there a potential for the coolant to contaminate the water um, or like would if the water is mixing with the coolant, how does that sort of filter work in that type of situation? Let's say the batteries failed and the coolant went into the containment and then it was raining at the same time, like a lightning strike or something. Um, how how does the system um function if there's if there's an input of rain during the spill itself? That is a very good question. They are designed, you know, for a flow rate that 
is um, you know it calculated, and there are uh, there's a main and a backup filter here. And I can certainly take that question back to the engineer of record on this and get you a more detailed answer um, so that I'm not uh, trying to guess. Let me uh, let me get you a detailed answer on that. Let's go on, Jason. Yeah, and just, you know, we're talking about rain, but also in the event of potential firefighting activity, which we would assume would have a higher flow rate than just rain. Sure. So uh, there are um, fire suppression systems on board that are aerosol based, as well as an optional dry pipe system that the, uh, the fire department can hook into and put water into the unit. So the, the initial firefighting would be uh, aerosol based. Does that include um, thermal, like if they're trying to reduce the thermal? Because I know sometimes they use water just to protect the surrounding batteries um, and keep the fire from spreading to the adjacent batteries as opposed to putting the fire out with the water. Mm -hmm. um, but it, I forget what they call it, the thermal um, spread to other batteries. Would the, um, the process that you're describing with the materials, would that um, serve that same purpose to prevent it from moving to the next battery? So, the, yes, these are UL and NFPA. Uh, listed and rated units, and I yeah. believe that that um, fire spread is covered under those ratings. Yeah, can I ask a question? Go so ahead, I think, um, hang on, wait, this, okay. So it's not, I don't know why my video is not working. Okay, whatever, I'm here. Um, there it is, okay. Um, it's my understanding that as part of any sort of battery system that, you know, we're just focused on the wetlands component here, but um, there would have to be obviously communication with the fire department of, of Amherst and that the typically, you know, the best practice with any sort of fire that may happen is actually, you know, and Aaron, you know this as well as I, is to not open up or put water on the container and to let it burn and stay contained so it doesn't spread elsewhere. Um, and I think clearly like the best, I have a lot of experience looking at these types of projects across multiple states um, and certainly the best designs for, um, you know, systems that I've seen, not surprisingly at this scale have been in New York City. And I think the fire department of New York has really set the bar in terms of, you know, what are the best safety measures. So I'm wondering if you can just speak to, obviously we're not New York city, um, but I think it'd be helpful as far as like coolant leaking and things like that, like things that you have done, you know, uh, that are, are just more um, broadly recognized um, because I think this team just, doesn't know a ton about battery storage and it's a good time to educate them. Sure, I think that's where we would point to the NFPA ratings and the UL listings of these batteries and leave it to those experts. I, I think right? you need uh, to, can you explain what those acronyms are? Sure, Everyone? so the, the NFPA is the National Fire Protection Agency and then UL being underwriters laboratories, the two kind of large uh, entities that check the battery storage equipment, and then all types of major electrical equipment, really, they get installed. Um, you know, the NFPA uh, are the people that write the National Electric Code. Um, and so these are, you know, really the, the authorities in terms of safety for batteries. And these units are brand new and tested under the most recent versions of those uh, battery storage uh, regulations. And so, um, you know, certainly we can answer any specifics, I guess, uh, with a little bit of homework as to, you know, which part of which uh, rating, you know, would address those. But, uh, you know, you, you did mention kind of letting the units burn out. They do have um, deflagration vents, which, you know, purposely would take any type of, uh, you know, burning or combustion in the units and direct them into a safe area. And, you um, have you know onboard fire suppression uh, aerosol like we talked about as well as uh, smoke alarms thermal alarms and all types of different early warning systems so that we would know um, you know hopefully ahead of time before there was an issue and what can you just remind me again where is the interconnection for for this unit how far away is the 
with the yeah how, how where is the interconnection coming into it's a line of sight and uh, so if we go to the plan right here this is the unit itself and the point mm -hmm. of interconnection is just right here so very uh, very short line of sight okay and where is it that's the interconnection where's it is, where's this closest substation on here it's about um, 1400 feet to the west over okay. on it's the okay. podic substation on sunderland okay okay One what was the purpose of that question, Laura? I'm curious. The proximity curious of the substation. Okay. <laughs> to, to know what I mean, like I'm assuming this the work you're that we're looking at here. This is this is wetland area that we're looking at here, right? So point of interconnections here. I'm assuming any work you'll be doing to the interconnection would also be, you know, to tie in would be a part of our review as well, right? Yes. Correct. And this is using the existing interconnect that's already there. So there's going to be an underground from that um, battery pad to the actual interconnect that exists. There'll be an additional pole that's added. Okay. So not like extensive upgrades, it's just an additional pole. Correct. It's, this was, it, you know, um, originally planned. If you look at the site plan that's up in front mm -hmm. of you, you'll see a red box in the northeastern corner. That's where we originally permitted this energy storage with this commission and um, the town of Amherst. And Eversource um, was unwilling to interconnect it, even though we had an executed interconnection service agreement with them because they wanted line of sight between yeah. the disconnect and this yeah. site. Yeah, I mean, that's that happens regularly in the state and yeah. everywhere, unfortunately. But yeah, um, if only we could be the utility. Um, <laughs> so, all right. One, one other point that, that Colin didn't mention is that for all batteries, it, this one included, they have to be tied to a national operations center, which has 24 seven uh, monitoring, not only of those smoke alarms, but the temperatures as well. And so we have used CES um, as our knock on these to monitor our assets 24 seven. We have two operating assets, one in Sandwich, uh, Massachusetts, and one in, um, Great Barrington uh, that are energy storage that are coupled with our solar. And um, CES would be the group that we would look to to man the monitoring of that National Operations Center. Thanks, Jeff. Bruce. So just very quickly, can one of the consultants tell us what is the status of your discussions with the Amherst Fire Department? We submitted a, uh, we submitted a uh, energy management plan with them um, updated for for the original site um, and it was approved and we have submitted an updated plan with them um, for this as well and um, are just awaiting some feedback from them. Okay. Um. Any other commissioner questions or comments? And public, if you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll get there. Rachel. Yeah, thanks for explaining about the containment system. I guess, um, and it's great that you're following the standards, um, but for the commission to review and understand the impacts of um, something bad happening and the impacts of the wetlands, it'd be helpful to know what happens in the case of fire you know what is in the aerosols what is coming out from the batteries when it burns how is that managed and contained so that we can understand if there's something coming off site from that battery into the wetland area that we want to know about um so I, I don't know if you have boilerplate descriptions of that that you could share prior to the next meeting um that'd be really helpful Thanks, Rachel. I was going to ask something similar, which is just that, um, I, yes, thank you for explaining the containment system. And there's the pending question sort of posed by Aaron first about sort of the admixing of water and whatever viscous anything is coming out of the batteries. I'm sorry, I don't know what it is, but I can't imagine that they remain separate. And it does seem like there would be some water contamination 
coming from it. So that's going to be my baseline assumption. And I'd love to know more about it because it does seem like um, lightning strikes or large water events are sort of where things go wrong. And so we are always, always preparing for the you know worst case scenario, obviously. Um, and also to prevent the thermal runaway, water is generally used to do that. So water does come into play there is some filtration system, there is mixing between the water that will go into the wetland and whatever the contaminants are, and the interaction there and, and, um, you know, what Rachel said, what what's going into the water. And then I would like Aaron, could you remind us if you know where this river flows to what it is a tributary to or where does it go or whose property does it flow on to? Um, that it's is a, a great stream. question. I can look it up. Sure. Really well, we'll quick. Go, I'll go to um, Jason I, while you check it out. Jason, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Um, I just wanted to mention too, then, if things pass through that filter and go into that stone trench, that stone trench is meant to infiltrate. So then are those contaminants potentially going into any groundwater, you know, and then getting into the stream there and the tributary? Yeah. Um, so sort of relatedly to um, current discussion, uh, those are some things that we're interested in is groundwater and um, surface water contamination and what, what that is and how it might happen. Um, Aaron, well, if, it looks like you're still looking it up. I, yeah, I, just... I got it. It, it okay. goes into Eastman Brook, so eventually into Mill River. Okay, Mill River and eventually, so past puffers but into Mill River and then yeah it flows um it flows south so under Route 63 um by the through the Cherry Hill Golf Course area and then uh it goes under Route 63 and moves towards Sunderland Road um and it goes eventually under 116 and then moves south, connects to the Swamp Brook and then into the Mill River um, over by Meadow Street. Okay, thanks, Sarah. That's where the tributary goes, is what I'm saying. The tributary yeah. that uh, the Eastman Brook um, stream flows that direction. Thanks, Sarah. Um, okay, if there's no further comments from commissioners, I see an attendee. I see Michael Lipinski. Um, Aaron, do you mind bringing him in? I don't have. Yeah. Permissions. Thanks. Hi, I'm Michael Lipinski, one six seven Shootsbury Road in Amherst. I just was hoping that the uh, developers could put up a spec sheet on the battery storage systems so that we could get the name and the model number of the batteries or at least spell it out. Uh, it went by so quickly, I wasn't able to actually get the name of the battery company. Thanks, yeah. Michael. Is that something you guys can answer now? Absolutely. Colin, do you have a spec sheet you can share on this call or do you want to provide that information after the call? I can. Let me, uh, let me just find one here. So, and I'll give a little background. Sokamec is the name of the manufacturer. They're a French company that has been a manufacturer of electrical uh, equipment and components for over a hundred years. Um, and so they have a manufacturing facility in Toronto, which is where this unit specifically is manufactured. Thanks, Jeff. And I'm just uh, looking for one of those cut sheets here and trying to find one with the whole uh, system kind of in a nutshell, it's hard to find just one sheet sometimes. Um, I, th I think Sokomek is the uh, is the key here. And let's just share my screen, put it up. 
Do you know how long they've been in the battery business? Um, I don't. I know that this they started with this unit um, 10 years ago in Europe and brought it over to the United States okay. um, after proving it out there. Great. Um, yeah, that's that's all I was looking for. The, this sheet is great. And so allow me to look up it and do more research on it. Appreciate it. Thank you. And okay. then here are the NFPA and UL safety codes uh, that we referenced. Yep. Perfect. Thank you guys for being really prepared. That's helpful. Okay. Um, so I think we've discussed some questions from commissioners. We've discussed having maybe um, a reconciliation of some stormwater features um, per Rachel's comment about LIDAR not matching up with on the ground um, features. And we've talked about uh, redelineating the new footprint and the mitigation area and uh, a more current and leafed out mapping situation for the invasive treatment plan. Is there anything else? Um, Aaron, I assume you've been jotting down questions. Alex, go ahead. Yeah, I suggested that we consider a third party. Yeah, is that is this the time period for which we'd want to do that? Um, I mean, I'm I'm fine with that. I just I'm not sure we're at the trigger point for it. Aaron, do you have any comments about that as far as the invasive mitigation plan? It seems like we're furthest along with that. So maybe it is a point to do that. Um so the I guess uh, I hadn't anticipated that that was going to come up, but um, I mean, I think it comes down to the commission's level of comfort with the accuracy of the information being provided. Um, if if the commission feels that that's the best route, then that's a possibility. Um, Another possibility would be to do another site visit and see, you know, where the identified stands are with an associated map and see if they appear to be accurate. And if so, then it might kind of circumvent that. I just, the only reason the third party peer review is, is a lengthy process, which doesn't necessarily mean we shouldn't do it if it's, if it's necessary. It's just that if there's um, accurate information and, and we could do it in another way that keeps it moving, that's also um, a possibility to consider. Yeah, it was my understanding from the last meeting that we had that there would be a second site visit and there would be some more specific invasive mapping and that didn't happen. So currently I'm not comfortable because there hasn't been any kind of specific mapping or delineation. Um, so unless that does happen with actual like ground truth GPS and verifiable um, invasive locations and species that we can go out in the field and see, then I then I would suggest a third party. Um, I don't particularly want to go out there and walk the five acres to verify something that's not verifiable because we don't have any data. Um, so I can leave it to the, the applicants to decide how they want to provide that. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, I just want to avoid he said, she said. We um... Um, what we've heard from the applicant is there's lots of invasive species. We heard that tonight and we went to great effort to provide them an idea of what we were looking for for a mitigation plan and that hasn't come forward. And um, I thought if we could have an independent party with us, if we're going to identify plants, we stay away from us and them having a discussion about what species of plant is and we have some objective person. That was all. Not not to go out and verify something that hasn't been delineated. Uh, I was just trying to think of a way to more quickly get th through it because we did go to some effort to go out and see what we thought was there. And we didn't find much. True. So, but, um, thanks, Alex. Uh, Does any commissioner have any comments on this one? Yeah. And I to finish up, I, I'd like to see a better response to what we asked for. 
that just didn't come through tonight with what Scott provided. Are you speaking in relation to the mitigation plan, Alex? Yeah. And yeah. let me let me kind of raise my hand and say that may fall on Lodestar side. I'm not sure we communicated it as well as we could have to Scott. So um, if it makes sense to ask Scott to go out and do a site walk and do a more detailed location. And if there is some disagreement, I think we'd be happy to, you know, either meet or, you know, I, I think Scott's very reasonable. And if something is misidentified, I think we're happy to, you know, just identify that and try to fix whatever um, mapping we can do on there and see if we're all in agreement on it. Sounds great. Aaron, go ahead. I was just going to suggest maybe prior to scheduling a site visit, we could be pro uh, provided with the map of where those locations are. That way, when we go out on a site visit, they're they're already sort of identified on a map and we know where we're going and what we're looking at. Yeah, and I'm thinking polygons of, of species and areas and just something that we can walk up to and see. Um, and again, this is in the no build. And so this is important because for us to make this exception, it's sort of hinging on some sort of mitigation um, to compensate for that. So it's it's no small thing to me anyway, um, to see that there'll be some greater impacts from you know building in this area, which I just want to say is sort of a, a sandy, loamy, early successional corridor that because of the soils maintains an early successional status, um, which is somewhat exceptional in the Northeast. So it's not going into forest, it's maintaining a river corridor for wildlife and early successional species. Um, and, you know, that's, that's an impact that uh, it's not, it's, it's, it's not a common habitat, I guess I would say. Um, I see you, Scott. I'm just going to let Alex say something, and then we're going to we'll go to you. Uh, yeah, the the soon. other, excuse me, but the the other intent was to make the place better, not and maybe eliminating this the the uh, invasive species makes it better. But if there were other opportunities to improve the site, um, and if there's a low invasive uh, um, population around the project in the area you've identified. There are five lots, and um, so we asked that if it's a low density of invasive species that you look at the other lots and just reiterate that. I'm done. Yeah, thanks. I'm not sure we can um, extend our order of conditions onto the other lots, but Bruce, I saw your hand up. It's now down. Should I just go to Scott? Uh, no, I just wanted to, to agree with what you said. I definitely think that this particular habitat needs special attention. Thanks, Bruce. Scott. Yeah, I just wanted to make it clear that I have no intention of uh, doing any uh, spraying herbicides on alders, right? I, you know, that's not what we do. Um, so we can uh, make a make a map and provide that to you. It wasn't clear to me that's what you needed, but I understand that very clearly now. And we can provide that and and make sure that uh, the species are identified. I think I was actually looking at the pictures while you were talking about the fire safety uh, drainage issues and such. And uh, you know, so a lot of I, I still think there's a lot of invasive plants out there from what I could remember. But I, I will be glad to go out there and double check. Okay, thanks, Scott. I'm glad we had this conversation to get on the same page. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, well, we've had it. Go ahead, Rachel. Um, speaking of peer review, would the commissioners also want a stormwater peer review considering um, potential contamination to groundwater and surface water? That's an interesting question. Um, I, I, I haven't, I'd be curious to know, I haven't heard of uh, the way um, these are designed is typically there's there's not stormwater runoff, but um, it's hard to visualize, so I understand the question for sure. But um, Aaron, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, the... I think I think we need more information. Yeah. I think we should give the applicant an opportunity to respond with more information. Yeah, I agree. And Before then we decide about the third the new... party. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. I and mean, I think we should definitely get, yeah, give them that yeah, opportunity. Yeah, that's where I'm going to. I think we have some standing, we have some more work to do and reviews um, and information. And so it, hopefully that's acceptable, Rachel. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, with that, and hopefully everything is clear. And if not, please get in touch with Erin and we can all make sure we're on the same page about what was discussed tonight. But I'm looking for a motion to continue this public hearing for Montague Road, NOI DEP number 0890731 to July 10th, 2024 at 7.40 p.m. So moved. I move to continue the public hearing for Montague Road, NOI parens DEP number 089-0731 and parens to July 10th, 2024 at 7.40 p.m. Second. It's Jason. Alex on the motion, Jason on the second. Rachel? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Laura? Aye. Alex? Aye, and I'm glad I was not muted when I went through that. <laughs> and I'm an aye. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Um, Thank you for your time. Yep. Good night. Appreciate it. Okay, um, Conservation Land Management Subcommittee. So this, uh, I will hand over to Alex, who is the chair of our Conservation Land Management Subcommittee, and he will provide our update. Um, please go ahead, Alex, with an eye on the time. Thank you. Yeah, give me an idea. I, I think I've got, well, I can get it done in 10 minutes. Less than that, if there aren't questions. So first of all, I want to acknowledge that Michelle and Bruce are on the subcommittee uh, to look at the land use policy document. And we've had Aaron and Dave participating in our meetings for about a year. And um, our existence ex uh, expires at the end of this month. So uh, we haven't finished our job. We had about 30% of our meetings canceled for good reason. And we would like to continue, but tonight we would like to give um, uh, the commission a particular policy that we have finished for your review. It is on agriculture and it's in a folder. And uh, we went through some updates to make sure you have the right document. So if you looked at it early, you might want to check uh, on what's in there now because it, uh, it wasn't the most up-to-date that, that was posted originally. So we're asking that the commission um, um, look it over and provide us comments through Aaron, and we will respond to those uh, as best we can in, a, in an orderly fashion and quickly. And with that, I would like to ask the commission to give us an extension for six months with the idea that we would try hard to finish early and not take all of that six months. And during that six month period, um, we would give you, continue to give you pieces of the document. Um, I think the agriculture is probably the biggest section and uh, ask for your review as we go through this. And in the end, we'll have a finished document and we'll give you uh, the whole document in the end. And we thought it was better to give you pieces because uh, each each piece stands alone. So um, I see Bruce has his hand up. Um, make it better, Bruce. I just want to, um, I'm pretty sure that the document that is in the packet is the correct document. However, I think it says the, the title it says document 16, version 16, but the title on the document says 15. So feel free to cross out the 15 and make it 16 because that's what it's supposed to be. The other thing I would point you to is the next phrasing, which is that at some point in this process, it has to go to the town attorney. And we have checked with the town attorney on a, a variety of topics, but in the end, the attorney will have to read the whole thing again to make sure that there's not problems. Thank you. Yeah, so I wanna um, lift my hat to Bruce because Bruce spent an inordinate amount of time putting this document together and also thank Dave Zomack for his work on advising us about agriculture and of course Aaron and we had several field trips out to look at potential agricultural sites 
areas that had been in agriculture, which are now, we don't have, um, we have one agricultural activity going on, but other than that, we have no licensees. Um, so we kind of have a fresh start. And um, um, there's a lot in this document, a lot of work went into it, and we're curious for your feedback. There's also another document in the folder, which should be in Appendix A, um, but it is a ranking form. And is the first draft that Bruce came up with, we didn't fiddle around with it. We just give it to you the way it is and ask for your comments. It's a, it's a document in process, um, just like the ag, ag document. The ag document's fairly mature, but please also look at the ranking document. And that's there in case we have multiple applicants for uh, an agricultural lot. And we wanted to have a ranking system in order to help make a decision on who would get the the licensee, how we who would get the license. So that's all I have to say. It's open for questions. And I also ask the commission for six months extension. Thanks, Alex. Um, right, so tonight we would ask you, the commissioners, to vote on that extension. Um, and just for some geographical context associated with the agricultural uh, licenses, so some sites that are would be under consideration would be Podic has um, in front of the parking lot. There's a former agricultural field, um, Wentworth and Fort River, um, the farm area where the community garden is, um, went, I already said Wentworth, uh, I guess Eastman Brook. Um, so those are Amethyst. some of the, sorry. Amethyst was formerly Amethyst. farmed as well. Yep. So and those are Haskins some of the Meadow. sites. Haskins Meadow. Um, right. So those are some of the former and potential agricultural sites that would be under consideration. Okay. Um, if there's any questions, take them. Otherwise, um, I guess I'm looking for, do we need a motion to extend this or? Yes. Okay. We're, we're, yeah. we're under a fairly formal um creation document which lays out our mission and gave us a length of time to get our job done so we need to somehow update that okay do you have a suggested motion alex i move the commission grant the subcommittee on land use to grant a six months extension of uh, uh its opportunity to um finish this job or you can I wasn't prepared to do that you kind of caught me off guard <laughs> that's uh, that's we, fine we uh, we're, we're moving to grant the uh agricultural use subcommittee it's the land uh management Sorry, subcommittee. the land yep. management subcommittee uh an additional six months to finish the preparation of the agricultural use policy for conservation lands document and no, it's, it's the entire policy document which was circulated or circulated around and commented on before you got on the board but there's a whole lot there's what to do with dogs what to do with community gardens what to do with all kinds of things um rules and right, regulations so for what's use the name of it? the document that you all are preparing. Yeah. Land management plan. All right. Oh, I should Aaron, go ahead and save us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So the name of the committee is the the Conservation Land Management Subcommittee. The Conservation Land Management Subcommittee has a specific charge, um, which are certain sections of the um, conservation land use policy. So the conservation land use policy has been being drafted for probably the last two years. Um, and uh, it's a culmination of many policies that have been in place in the town on conservation land, as well as some new policies. Um, but it includes things like rules, reg rules and regulations, agriculture, um, uh, other uses, land use applications, which we've discussed before and, and, and so on. Um, but the, there, there are specific sections that the um, 
land management subcommittee is charged with updating within that document, which are still outstanding. So I want to apologize. Um, I assumed prior knowledge about the subcommittee, and I shouldn't have done that. I should have included an introductory uh, section to what I had to say so that people would know what's going on. And thank you, Aaron, for saving my bacon. Okay, we still need a motion. All right, so sorry, it's the land use policy document. Right. So what we're, I'll just kind of cue this up for you guys. What we're looking for is for the conservation land management subcommittee to be extended for an additional six months so that they can complete their charge. I move that the conservation land management subcommittee be extended for another six months so that they can finish their charge. I second. Thank you, Jason, on the motion. Rachel on the second. Rachel? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Laura? Welcome back to Laura. Alex? Aye. Laura? Okay, I'm an aye. I think we have. Laura's on mute. Yeah, she might have just stepped away, but it's okay. We have a critical mass. Um, Thank you, okay. Sorry? I should have had something written. All good. We move forward. Okay. Um, so we're moving on to request for minor administrative change to the order of conditions, and this is in regards to Amherst Hills. So I guess I'm going to go in order of our PowerPoint presentation here. So lot six, we're suggesting now that this be tabled um, for the time being and um look we're possibly looking for an amendment on this one Aaron let me out here the yeah so on lot six the applicant um requested um a minor administrative change to the plan um but I've been playing phone tag with the um applicant for the last couple weeks so um I haven't actually made contact with with them to um discuss the additional detail that's needed on the plan for the commission to consider it. So just would ask that the commission table that um, to the next meeting when I might have more information to share. Okay. Thanks, Aaron. I have no problem with that. Um, I'd like to move on for the request for extensions of order of conditions for lot five through eight. So we did discuss these last time and we were um, we decided that we needed more information from the town attorney regarding the legal implications a, of granting or not granting this extension. Um, so based on the advice from the town attorney, staff is recommending that there be an extension for a three year period. Uh, I see Alex's hand so up. So want... yeah, go ahead. I Anna. just want to clarify one thing, Michelle. Um, it's actually a two-year request. That was a typo on my part. The request okay. is for a two-year extension, not three okay. years. Okay, thank you. Um, Alex, did you want to comment? No, I wrote to Erin before the meeting about that, and she has answered my question. Okay. Um, it, says two there... years. it says two years in the minutes that we approved. Okay, so it's two years. Noted. Um Okay, so we could vote to make that extension happen. Other options would be site visits if people felt uncomfortable with doing that tonight. Um, otherwise, you have we we wanted the weigh in from the town attorney, and we have it. So there it is. Um, Alex. Aaron, is it worth explaining what the town attorney told you, or would you just as soon not talk about that during this meeting? No, I'm happy to share what was um, discussed with, with Alex Weissight from KP Law. Um, I basically explained the situation with both of these um, uh, sets of orders of conditions, the more recent four lot um, individual orders of conditions for lots uh, five through eight, and then also um, 
the situation with the with the larger overall subdivision plan. Um, on the individual lot, he did recommend that we issue the extension as requested, and the rationale for the the reasoning was because he said that recently he's had uh, quite a few cases and several that he's litigating right now where commissions did not grant um, uh, extensions to orders of conditions that had been issued fairly recently and um, that there has just been a long and very expensive litigation process, which um, they, there is no guarantee that the commission is actually going to win um, in in court. And so because it's been very expensive for the cities and towns that have, have taken those legal actions, um, he strongly urged the Conservation Commission to either extend or have a very solid legal um, defensible rationale for why the extension wasn't granted. Thanks, Erin. Um, I mean, my original position was to extend this, or if there's any discussion, please raise your hand. Otherwise, I think we received the feedback that we were looking for and we have a suggested action, in which case I'm looking for a motion. And I would and, recommend that we do individual motions yes. for each. Um, and the motion, you can't share your screen, can you? Okay, so hmm, I guess I'll share my screen and there is a suggested motion which somebody could then insert each lot number. I don't think there's a suggested motion for that, okay. um, but it would just be something to the effect of, if we're talking about lot five, for example, um, the motion would be to grant a two-year extension to DEP number and then the DEP number for an additional two years. Erin, it's the same applicant, um, why 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 the extra work why not just lump them all together well because each of these is an individual order of conditions um and because of that i recommend we have an individual motion for both for all of them um it's i think uh cleaner and um okay, okay. just it, you know yeah. you answer the question and jason just to be clear, it's a is it a three year? It's a two year period, correct? It's a two year. A two year. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll do the first one. I move that we grant a two year extension to the order of conditions for lot number five, DEP number zero eight nine zero six six two. Second. Chris on the motion. Jason on the second. Rachel. I have to abstain since my firm did the survey. Okay, I'm going to have to call on you for each one of them to just say abstain. Okay, Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Laura? Aye. Uh, abstain. Okay, Alex? Aye. I'm an aye. Question. Go ahead. Does the same motion have to be made, or can we make a motion that we... Uh, oh, never mind. We can get it all done by the time I end. I think if we just go for it, we can get it done quicker yeah, than I talking mean, about it. I yeah, can, 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 so the motions are all the same. Could somebody type it up on the screen? I'll just go through it, Alex, real quick. Thanks. Okay, good. I move that we approve uh, the extension for a two-year period of the order of conditions for lot number six, DEP number 089 dash zero six six three. Second. Jason on the motion, Alex on the second. Rachel? Abstain. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Laura? Abstain. Alex? Aye. And I'm an aye. Did I'm Laura sure. abstain again? Yes, correct. Okay. I move that we uh, approve the extension for a two-year period to the orders of conditions for lot number seven, DEP number 089-0664. Second. Jason on the motion, Alex on the second. Rachel? 
Ben. Bruce. Aye. Jason. Aye. Laura. Abstain. Alex. Aye. And I'm an aye. I move that we approve the extension for a two-year period of the orders of conditions for lot number eight, DEP number 089-0665. Second. Jason on the motion, Alex on the second. Rachel? Same. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Laura? Abstain. Alex? Sorry. Alex? Aye. And I'm an aye. Is that it? We have yep. one more to go for the oh, well for we have we got we got Amherst Hills, but that's it. Okay, that was eight. Okay, sorry, I just spaced out. Um all right, so we just need to make a sort of re-motion on Amherst Hills because of an administrative issue. So I'm just looking for a motion. I move as... I move to deny extension of the order of conditions DEP number 089-0432 per 310CMR 10.05 parens 8 close parens parens B close parens 1 dot and 5 dot. I second. Alex on the motion, Jason on the second. Rachel? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Jason? Aye. Laura? Abstain? Alex? Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, all right, enforcement compliance updates, uh, 11 trillion. We received a planting plan, but we see received it today and that was not in time for adequate review. Um, I think I saw the applicant here, but based on the fact that it's nine o'clock, I think we're gonna table this to next time and give all of the uh, commissioners a chance to read the planting plan um evaluate it based on our previous discussions if you have comments please send them to Erin and she can communicate them to the applicant um and hopefully that will prepare us for a productive discussion for next meeting sound like a plan to everybody okay um wildflower drive um we've had some positive movements in the right direction here so there's been Receipts provided for consultations on wetlands and delineation, so that's great. Um, and given that, I think we can cancel our executive session that was planned for tonight. And based on that also, I don't think we need to reschedule the executive session pending continued positive um, forward moment momentum with uh, resolving the enforcement issues. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron, for continued efforts in this one. Absolutely. It is not a fun not part of the job. <laughs> um, but thank you, Aaron, for watching out for those wetlands. Um, okay. Forest cutting plan, uh, please review correspondence in your folder to see what's going on with that. It's kind of a long running conversation. Um, staff are going to be having conversations um, with various departments uh, about that, I think. And um, we're gonna table that one. Uh, public comment, if there's any public comment, raise your hand now and I will take a look. Um, monitoring reports, Erin, all good things. Um, I, yeah, I don't have anything really um, crazy to report. Um, there there, there um, is a meeting on Friday or yeah, Friday um, at Fort River School because um, on the Fort River School stabilization, they were supposed to put um, um, erosion control blankets over the entire footprint of the site, and they only put them on the side slopes, and there's been some erosion. So we're meeting with the contractor and the designers to, to try to resolve that and come up with a, um adequate stabilization strategy for the, for the building pad. Um, so I'll report back to you on what, what is discussed. Saren, it's a very big building pad, isn't it? Very <laughs> big. It's like an yesterday. acre and a half. It's huge. Yeah, it's huge. Um, yeah. Big pile of dirt. Okay. <laughs> All right. I think that that brings us to the end. Um, and I don't see any hands raised. So 
if there's no further comments, um, let's end just a little over nine and looking for a motion to close. Make a meeting. motion to close this meeting. Second. We're on the motion, Jason on the second. Rachel. Aye. Bruce. Aye. Jason. Aye. Alex. Laura. Aye. Okay, thanks everyone. And just a reminder, there is some homework, <laughs> which is please take a look at the agricultural plan, um, review some of the correspondence in your folders and the open space and rec survey, um, specifically that, so we can talk about it um, in earnest next time. Okay, thanks everyone. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Good night. Good night.